you've got your Bible or your Bible app open, then I invite you to uh, keep it open and uh, let's just pray together. <coughs> Father God, will you just come to us, make us aware of your presence as we open your word this morning? Will you speak to us? Will you encourage us? Will you help us to be encouragers of each other through your word? And may we, because we have done, because we have been encouraged today, go and do something beautiful for you this week in the day and the days to come. Amen. Amen. Now I don't want to worry you, but I want to tell you about a plague which is going through Christians and some of our churches. You'll be glad to know it's not coronavirus. It's not even monkey flu. It's not bird flu. It's not swine flu. It's probably something that you may not have heard of before. It's called the Eeyore syndrome. Ever come across anybody who's been infected with the Eeyore syndrome? I'm sure there is nobody here who has the Eeyore syndrome, but you may be able to think of someone. You may even be able to think of a Christian who goes around like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. They're the kind of person who looks on the gloomy side of life. Everyone and everything is against them. The decisions that the leaders make are there simply to wind them up. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> this is what happens when you haven't spoken publicly for a fortnight. They're the ones you hear saying, things aren't what they used to be. Things aren't being done in the right way. When somebody says to you, things aren't being done in the right way, what they really mean is, people aren't doing them the way that I do them. They look at the floor. Their faces often look like a wet weekend in Yarmouth. Now, if Yarmouth is one of your favourite places to go to, I apologise. There are some beautiful parts of Norfolk, but Great Yarmouth is not one of them. Even a dry weekend in Yarmouth doesn't look that great. A wet weekend in Yarmouth is even worse. The only thing they get enthusiastic about is telling you how bad things are. That's how you know if somebody has been infected with the Eeyore syndrome. Now, we've been reminded this morning that a banana and a watermelon and a coconut and a grape and all of those other fruits that you tried to get through isn't one of the fruit of the spirits. Well, the Eeyore syndrome is not a fruit of the spirit either. Let's remind ourselves what Paul tells us the fruit of the spirit is. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Do you see what's missing in that list? Not just coconuts, grapes, and lemons, but complaining and always looking on the gloomy side of life. That's not in the list. Did you know that? So... If we are growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then that's a vaccination against the Eeyore syndrome. Because if you're growing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, if you're growing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, then those things are what control your life, not the Eeyore syndrome. It's very easy, I think, for some of us, and I would count myself in this, to be discouraged, to become discouraged. What do we mean by discouraged? Well, here's a definition from William Ward, who's a Christian writer, and I thought it was quite helpful. It says this, discouragement is dissatisfaction with the past, distaste for the present, and distrust of the future. That covers everything. It is ingratitude for the blessings of yesterday, indifference to the opportunities to today and insecurity regarding strength for tomorrow that covers everything as well it's unawareness of the presence of beauty unconcern for the needs of our fellow man and unbelief in the promises of old it is impatience with time immaturity of thought and impoliteness <laughs> to god that's 
how bad discouragement is. <coughs> when we're discouraged or when we discourage other people, then that's what we bring into their lives. So over the next few minutes, we're just going to have a look at the way that Nehemiah deals with discouragement in Nehemiah chapter 4. Now, it's been a couple of weeks. In fact, it's been three weeks since I pre uh, preached on Nehemiah because the Sunday before I went away, it was second Sunday. So just to remind you of the story, God has made Nehemiah aware of the state of Jerusalem's walls, which are in disrepair and the city's parlous state because it's left undefended. And so Nehemiah approaches the king and asks for permission to rebuild the walls. And miraculously, the king says, yes, he can do that. Having said to another group years before that they were not able to do it. And so he travels to Jerusalem and he inspects the walls and then he recruits the city and other people to help rebuild the walls. If you look back in Nehemiah chapter 3, the chapter before we just read, then you can see that the walls have begun to be rebuilt. Then we get to chapter 4. In chapter 4, there is a response to the fact that the people of Judah are rebuilding the city's walls. In verses 7 and 8, we read, When Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. So what was the people of God's response to the fact that their enemies were so furious about the fact that they were rebuilding the walls? Did they go, that's okay, we're just going to carry on anyway? No, they were infected by the Eeyore syndrome. Verse 10 says, the people of Judah began to complain that workers are getting tired and there is much rubble to be moved. We'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. They threw a pity party for themselves. We're never going to be able to do this. It's not worth the effort. We're tired. There's so much to be done. And to be fair... I guess it's not a surprise that the people of Judah were discouraged because they did face many enemies. In fact, as you read through Nehemiah to this point, it seems like their enemies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more of them. So we had Sambalat and his sidekick Tobiah to start with. Then along comes a mysterious Arab called Geshem who we know nothing about apart from his name. Then we had the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. And Jerusalem is surrounded by enemies from Samaria, Ashdod, Edom, and Ammon. It's being pressurized by all of its neighbors. And all of them have political reasons for cutting Israel down to size and ensuring that it doesn't become too confident and self-sufficient to ensure that it, its city remains un defended. So it's no wonder, I guess, that the people of God were feeling discouraged. But if that wasn't bad enough, if it wasn't enough that they'd angered their enemies by starting to rebuild the wall, the enemies go one step further and start to, to ridicule them. They start laughing at what they're doing. If you look at verse 2, it says uh, that they were saying in front of their friends and the Sumerian army officers, what do these bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something from stones, uh, of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? They were mocking him. They said, you're never going to be able to manage to do this. Sam Ballot and his friends looked at them and their human resources and called them feeble. They attacked the work that they were doing. They denied that God could help them to rebuild the walls. And he didn't believe that the Jews' sacrifices, their equivalent of, of prayer and worship to God as we would do today, would help them achieve the future that they wanted to build. He scoffed to think that they would even finish the project. And that if they did, then the walls would soon be in ruin again. It's no wonder they were discouraged, really. But they were also discouraged because they were surrounded by rubbish. They say in verse 10, there is so much rubble to be moved. They were surrounded by rubbish. And it was getting in the way of the rebuilding. Now, you will 
probably be glad to learn as you get to know me that I don't really do any building work. If I did rebuild, if I did building work, it would probably end in rubble fairly quickly. But sometimes I do get to bake, not quite the same thing, slightly less masculine perhaps. But um, Gail will tell you after the meeting, if you ask her, she's probably nodding her head any minute now, that after about 15, or minute, 15 minutes or so in the kitchen, uh, the place usually looks like a bomb site, surrounded by rubble, or at least the baking equivalent of rubble. And sometimes I have to kind of clear up around me before I can carry on with the baking. Sometimes the best thing that we, can, that, that we can do when we're discouraged by the rubbish and the rubble in our lives is simply to clear it out. It's no wonder that the people of God were discouraged. So the first thing that we can take away from Nehemiah chapter 4 is that we shouldn't be discouraged if we feel discouraged. Is that okay? We shouldn't feel discouraged if we feel discouraged. Some of you are scratching your head and going, where are you going with this, Rob? What I mean is that feeling discouraged isn't a weakness. That's not what Nehemiah chapter 4 is saying. Don't ever feel that you must be weak and feeble and a bad Christian if you ever suffer from discouragement. Even the best Christians can feel discouraged at times. One of the greatest preachers of all time, C.H. Spurgeon, sometimes gave in to discouragement. He once said, I would not wish upon my worst enemy the depths of despair and discouragement I often feel for weeks or months at a time. And he's a Christian hero. Everyone feels discouraged at times. Judah, the people of Judah, were the chief tribe in Israel. The, tri the tribe of Judah were the leaders of the nation. And yet they were the ones who told Nehemiah that they couldn't continue, that they were discouraged. It's not a weakness to feel discouraged. You shouldn't feel discouraged because you feel discouraged. Even if you're suffering from Eeyore syndrome, you shouldn't necessarily see that a weakness. As long as you don't stay that way. You're not a bad Christian if you get discouraged. But you are a bad Christian, and by that I mean you're a bad reflection of God, if you choose to stay that way. If you choose to wallow in Eeyore syndrome, then you have a problem because you're not growing the fruit of spirit, the spirit in your lives. But if you remember that God is on your side, if you remember that he is there to stretch you as you grow in spiritual maturity, if you remember that his spirit is there to grow the fruit of the spirit in your lives, if you recall that he's there to help you grow through any discouraging circumstances you might find yourselves in, then you'll begin to have a positive impact on God's future for you and for his people. And this is important, not just for you, it's important for the people around you. Now, this always makes me sit up and take notice whenever I use this quote. But Jim Rohn, who's an American businessman and motivational speaker, says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Just think about that for a moment. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That means if you spend most of your time with negative people, with people who are suffering from Eeyore syndrome, then eventually you find yourself suffering from Eeyore syndrome. You find your, your, yourself becoming negative. Conversely, if you find yourself ever feeling discouraged or suffering from the Eeyore syndrome, then the best thing you can do is to find cheerful people and positive people to hang around because it rubs off on you. Anybody know someone whose smile just makes them feel better? Any, oh dear. Some, some of you need to find some people that are positive in your lives. 
Okay, some of you are still counting up the five people that you spend most of the time with. Okay, find someone whose smile just lights up the room and you'll begin to feel encouraged. You'll begin to feel more cheerful. That's one practical thing that we can do. Another practical thing that we can do is to do what Nehemiah did. What did Nehemiah do in the face of all this discouragement and the fact that his people had caught Eeyore syndrome? He prayed. Verses 4 and 5 say, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt, do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. Nehemiah prayed. He turned to God. He left control of those things in God's hands. He turned the discouragers over to God and said, will you deal with them? Then he moved on from that and he chose to be an encourager. I think there are too many discouragers in the world. I know there are none here, so you won't have met any here, but you may have met them somewhere else. Maidenhead Citadel needs encouragers. We need encouragers. God's future needs us each to be half glass full Christians, not half glass empty, or even, I haven't even got a glass Christians. Nehemiah sees that God's people are discouraged and in danger of simply giving up on the future God has planned for them. And so this is what he says. As I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and I encouraged them. I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah reminds them who God is, reminds them of the job that they're there to do on God's behalf and says, let's get on and do it. And because of his encouragement, that's exactly what they decide to do. So will we throw off discouragement this morning? Anybody ready to do that? Yeah? Good. Will we rid ourselves of any trace of the Eeyore syndrome? Are we going to submit to the vaccine of the fruit of the Spirit and grow that in our lives instead? To choose to see the positive rather than the gloomy. To choose joy rather than cheerlessness. When someone asks you, how are you? Will you choose to say something positive? Maybe. (laughs) Not quite sure about that one. Let's choose to be encouraged and to be encouragers. Well, I guess another definition of encourage is to take courage on board. And so that's what we're going to do in our final song. It's not a song that we sing very often these days, but we're going to sing it this morning. Don't blink, because you'll miss it. There's only two verses. It's 488 in the Salvation Army songbook, if you're using a songbook. And it simply says, Courage, brother and sister. If you can fit that in as well, then do that as well. Courage, brother, do not stumble, though thy path be dark as night. There's a star to guide the humble. Trust in God and do the right. Let the road be long and dreary and its end far out of sight. Foot it bravely, strong or weary. Trust in God and do the right. Trust in God and be encouraged. Let's stand and sing these two verses. <laughs>